Hello everyone, this is Jacqueline Lowe at Grace That Reigns. Welcome to the Electric Eel Series. We created our summer series of podcasts to give you a spiritual jolt out of your everyday life to help you to focus on the wonder of God and the wonder of the moment during these very trying times. Sometimes, wonder needs a jolt. Hello everyone, welcome to the Electric Eel series at Grace That Reigns. In this recording, I will be talking to Bishop Gilmore. He is the spiritual director of Grace That Reigns and also my ministry partner. He is also the retired bishop of the Diocese of Dodge City, Kansas. Today, he's going to share with us about a time when someone asks him a question, and he is literally stumped. You know, it must have been a jaw-dropping moment for him. After all, when people ask priests questions, they're supposed to know the answers, and they usually all do. But before we get into the story, I want to ask Bishop Gilmore a question. Hi, Bishop Gilmore. Hello, Jacqueline. How are you this morning? Very good. Can't wait to hear your story. I'm delighted to have the chance to share it with you. So, Bishop, you've been a priest for how many years? Going on 52 now. And a bishop for how many years? Going on 23. 23. So, you've had about how many years in total? I can't do the math. You're right the now. mathematician. You do that part. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's funny. Anyway, <laughs> it's a, it's quite a while. Looking back, <laughs> has there ever been a time when you were stopped in your tracks, an event that caused you to pause or to wonder? There has been indeed. Yes. Lots of times, but one in particular strikes me today. (laughs) That's great. Can you tell me more about that? And and because I've always wanted to to know, uh, because of your past and your experience, right? What made you you? Go ahead. Okay. Well, when I tell this story, Jacqueline, I like to start with a phrase, um, and the phrase is this. I never even knew her name. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. That pique your attention a little bit? I am being piqued. All right. She wasn't from the town that I lived in then, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, But she would come to Mass there at the odd time. Okay. So now and again, I would see her. She would show up, okay? Right, right. So she obviously made some kind of impression on me, right? Uh Uh-huh. She seemed attentive when she was there. Uh, She seemed reverent when she was there. Mm -hmm. She seemed kind of withdrawn and prayerful when she was there. She made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. She may have been shy. I deduced that because uh, never once did she stop to share a word with me after Mass, as people usually do. Mm-hmm. She so didn't do that. So, did you notice her? What was she wearing? Or was it anything unusual? Oh, I couldn't tell you that. Uh, she she looked, she she was paying attention at Mass. Right. She, she was um, uh, prayerful at Mass. She was reverent at Mass. But what she had, I, I, I don't know what she wore. So, you saw her... In the mornings or in your big Sunday Masses? Or? These were the Sunday Masses. I, I, I used to, I, w- I lived at one particular church in the town, and I helped at Mass in another church in the town. Mm-hmm. And I was at that other church. It was just, you know, not my place. Okay. So it's a so, small church, so you can see uh, all the people. It was a fairly large church. But large was, church. Yeah. But you still recognized, you know, who yeah, was in you, the you church. You pick out people who seem kind of attentive or paying attention to Mass. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's how it worked, all right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think much about her between times. I didn't think much about her never stopping to talk. I just didn't think about her. Okay. I saw her reg- uh, at intervals, and I recognized her, 
And then I forgot about her till the next time she would show up. Hmm. Okay, okay. So it was that kind of thing. Right. Me, all right. Now, the town I was living in then was a kind of a place of exile for me. I have to give you the background for me a little bit so you understand the story. Right, okay. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was an assignment that I did not at all want. Mm-hmm. It was a work that I did not at all like. Okay? Mm-hmm. The bishop and I had not seen eye to eye on things. Right. Okay? And he had had quite enough of me, I guess, by that time, because then I was suddenly gone. Okay. okay? I was removed. All right? Okay. I was down on him. Mm-hmm. You can understand that. Right. I was down on the new place. Okay. I'd never even been there before, but I was down on it already. Right. And I was down especially on the work that I was supposed to be doing. Okay. okay? Yes. All Not right. a good so time in your life. It gives you a feeling of where I was coming from yes. with this woman. All right. Mm-hmm. Now, as those painful days followed, one after the other, mm-hmm. all right, I slipped into the habit of making everything I did about form, shall we say. Now, okay. Just hang on. I'll explain it. Okay. Okay? Mm-hmm. Whether I was in the church or in the pulpit or in the school or in the confessional or in multiple counseling sessions, wherever I was, whatever I was doing, mm-hmm. I found myself really focused on technique. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's what I mean by form. Right. Technique. Mm-hmm. On the mechanics, on the how-to of preaching right. or teaching. Okay? Mm-hmm. I'm focusing on that more than anything else. Mm-hmm. All right? Mm-hmm. Now, that's a, a roundabout way of saying that I was interested in stories mainly. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Form, technique. Mechanics, how to mm-hmm. stories are how you you tell things. Okay, right. That was interested in that. Right. All right? Mm-hmm. So what happened was this: I would gravitate to good stories wherever I found them. Okay. Okay. At this time, that's what I was really looking for: good stories. All so right? you're talking about stories to tell. Stories yes. to tell. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm telling talking about the mechanics of communicating something to someone else. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I gravitated to good stories wherever I found them. Uh, the old nursery rhymes, for example, that my mother used to teach me. Mm-hmm. Those are good stories. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, Greek and Roman myths. Those are very good stories. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. The Brothers Grimm. Did you ever hear of them? The, the German brothers who mm-hmm. passed along the folk tales of the Germanic people? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Drawn to them. Short stories from every country. I was drawn to them. Novels. I was drawn to them. Mm-hmm. Whatever struck me, Jacqueline, uh, things that made me, whatever things that made me ask, what happens next? Mm-hmm. Whatever things that made me want to turn the page okay. and go on to find what happens next, okay. that's what I was really fascinated by. Right. Understand? Right. I understand. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, the readings of the Mass, mm-hmm. just to take what happens inside the church, the readings of the Mass of that day right. would provide the frame for my homilies. Okay, okay, I see. The, mm-hmm. the lessons of the Mass normally give you some basic Christian themes mm-hmm. that can be serve as a frame for what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So the readings of the Mass would provide the frame. I wasn't leaving that out. Mm-hmm. But what I would do would be to take those readings, mm-hmm. to take those themes, and into them... Right, the story. I would shoehorn a story. Exactly. You know how hard it is to get your foot in the shoe without a shoehorn? Uh, yes. You don't because you, you do it differently, I know. <laughs> the, the, I would shoehorn the story into that thematic setting of the Mass. Okay. Okay? Mm-hmm. All right. Now, the story became the heart of the homily. Ah. Uh, you understand that? Yes. All right. Okay. A good... Well-told stories would do one important thing for me. They would keep my congregation asking, 
what happened next. Ah. Keeps them leaning forward to hear what happened next. Right. Okay? Mm-hmm. And so good stories had that happy effect in a homily. At least that's what I told myself. Right. Okay? So you thought that you were successful in doing this. Yeah, I did. Yes. I did. See? Okay. Now, I was not really trying to elbow God out of his own church. Mm-hmm. Okay, I wasn't trying to elbow, elbow him out of his own pulpit, mm-hmm. you know, right. okay? Mm-hmm. At least not consciously I wasn't trying to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe I did have some nagging sense that I might not be right about all this story business. Mm-hmm. I might have had some nagging sense about that. I might have had some nagging sense that I might be losing my way, okay? Mm-hmm. That, that, that may have been there. I say... Uh, what do you mean I wasn't that? consciously trying to elbow him out of the picture. Right. But I did have a sense that maybe I wasn't doing it quite right. Ah, because you were focusing more on, on the stories, telling end of the story. The stories, okay. Yeah. okay. 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 All right. Mm-hmm. The stories were works works of art. Mm-hmm. I reasoned. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. They touched people. Mm-hmm. They stayed with people. Mm-hmm. And they tended to awaken in people a kind of a sense of wonder. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. That that's what I was that's what it was about. Finding awakening that sense of wonder. Okay? Okay. Now, nature often does that for us. The natural world. Mm-hmm. You know, the mountains and the oceans and, and the beautiful scenery of life. Nation nature often does that for us. It it does that. And art Mm-hmm. can also do that for us. You know, you're a painter. Mm-hmm. You know that art can really strike a, a, a chord in people, mm-hmm. can really touch a nerve in people. Mm-hmm. Okay? Art can do that as well as nature. There is a natural contemplation, just just being awake to the beauties of nature, mm-hmm. and that touches off wonder. Right. And there is an artistic contemplation. Mm-hmm. And that, too, touches off wonder, okay? And there's also a religious contemplation, and that touches off wonder as well. So in my mind, right. as I was doing all these things, in my mind, the one naturally led to the other. Right. They, they, they fit into a hole for me, okay? The release of wonder is what I was after, I use nature stories, I use artistic stories, I use religious words, all for the same purpose, trying to awaken the wonder. Uh, so in effect, you were doing this and captivating your congregation, trying. and you thought this was the way to do it. I did, yes. Okay, that's, I, I get it okay, now. Okay, mm-hmm. very fine, very fine. Okay? Mm-hmm. So I was happily doing... All this time, you know, for several years, mm-hmm. I was there about seven or eight years, this place. Mm-hmm. The first three or four, I was happily doing this kind of storytelling, mm-hmm. and it helped me greatly through what was an unhappy time right. in an unhappy place. Right. Okay? You understand mm-hmm. where yes. I'm coming from? All right. People responded to these stories. Right. Okay? Mm-hmm. They they followed them with attention. They uh, they uh, a wave of wonder did often wash over them. They told me these things. Okay. Okay. A wave of wonder did often wash over them, and they often went away pondering deeper questions about their own lives. So what are you saying? In effect, is this could have been the right timing for you? Yes, in some sense. Yeah, okay. I'm saying that. Yeah. All this, the, these things they told me, all these things were the things I was hoping for by doing that, mm-hmm. and all this is what I found. And because I found that, I got that kind of reaction from people, I just tended to blot out any nagging sense I might have had that maybe I wasn't quite on the mark here. Mm-hmm. What was that nagging? I mean, I don't know. You don't Jacqueline. know. Okay. It was more a thing that would become to you in the middle of the night when you wake up and couldn't go back to sleep, mm-hmm. kind of thing. But it wasn't really in words or anything. It was no, just a texture no, of it. No, it, it was a feeling. It was a sense. It was a suspicion. Oh. all that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. You understand that? Right. All right. Which brings me to the very climax of this story. 
Okay, I had to set you up mm -hmm. in order to understand how things were working. Okay, one Sunday, my shy woman was there again for mass, sitting in the same one place. One particular Sunday, she was there. <laughs> okay. okay, and what was different about it? You know, I noticed her because I noticed her every time she was there. But what was different this time was she did not melt into the crowd and disappear after the Mass was over. She didn't do that. Okay? At the church entrance, I would go to the... I'd walk down the center aisle, go to the church entrance and greet people on the way out after the Mass. Okay? At the church entrance, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed her standing back, standing there, watching and waiting. Ah, she was waiting for you. Okay, mm -hmm. I noticed that. All right. She stood and watched and waited as I greeted the people, as I patted their children on the head, mm -hmm. as I uh, promised to respond to their normal requests for prayers for this or that or the other thing. I do all those things in those kind of meetings. And as I fielded their kind words about my homily that I had just given. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All this was going on. It was a normal thing for me after Mass. Mm -hmm. All right. And going through all these motions, because I knew she was there, mm -hmm. looked as though she was waiting, I found myself nursing a vagrant thought. What did my unknown lady think about what I had been saying all this time? Ah. Oh. Okay. That wasn't really a consciously formulated thought, but there was some sense of, I wonder what she thinks. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. you, you follow me, mm -hmm. all right? Oh, yes, I'm following you and excited to know more. So when the crowd had thinned, I moved toward her to say hello at least, okay, because I never had, okay? She had never, she had never stopped to talk. To say hello at least. Right. To ask her name. Mm-hmm. And where she was from, just to get to know her a little, as I did with parishioners all the time. Right. Okay? Mm hmm But as I came up close to her, what I met was a very serious, even, I would say, sad face. Mm hmm Okay? Mm hmm And I met large, dark eyes. Okay? Mm -hmm. as, I, as I got closer to her, I could, because I, I can't see very well at a distance, so mm -hmm. I got closer to her, I could see these things. Right. Did this kind of sad face, these large dark eyes, and the thing I remember most was, they never blinked. Mm -hmm. You know how unsettling that can be? Oh, yes. All right. You know how unsettling that can be. <laughs> All right. They never blinked. That I remember. And then she said, Why? Don't you ever talk about Jesus. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa is right. You want to know my reaction? Yes. Her words froze me. Yeah. Wow. I, I didn't know what to say, what to do, how to move. Her words froze me. And I heard myself mumbling snatches of how homilies are made, how homilies are supposed to work. Uh, I heard myself mumbling some lame words about adjusting the message to the listeners, to the audience, all that theory about communication. Okay? Mm -hmm. I heard myself mumbling some variation on those different forms of wonder I mentioned earlier. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. I heard myself making mindless noise. I get it. Mm -hmm. Just as an attempt to change the subject. As an attempt to distract her. As an attempt to get away from her. I couldn't answer that question. Why did I never talk about Jesus? Mm -hmm. I just wanted, what I really wanted was for the floor to open up and to swallow me. Mm-hmm. I would have felt that way, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's what I really felt, mainly. In a stroke, she had left me unmasked. 
okay? Mm -hmm. She had left me exposed, like Adam and Eve after the apple. Maybe vulnerable? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She had left me found out and called out, okay? There was no escaping those knowing, unblinking eyes. Ooh. No escaping them. Mm. My nagging sense of maybe losing my way had been confirmed in a quick flash in that little question. Wow. And for someone like you who knew the answers and knew how to respond and knew what to say and it was very eloquent. Totally discombobulated I was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a huge And then expensive. she was gone. Did you see her turn away? I don't remember seeing her turn away. I don't remember her walking out of the church. I don't remember anything about it. I had that intense, unhappy relationship with her for that few moments. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get rid of her. I wanted her out of there. I wanted to go swallow me up, swallowed by the floor. Mm -hmm. And then she was gone. And I never, in all the rest of the time I was there... Probably two or more years, I never saw her again. Two or more years? Yeah. I was probably there another couple of okay. years. and you in, never saw her again? Parish, yeah. I never saw her again. Wow. But the simple question mm -hmm. in that awkward moment did stay with me. Obviously. I'm telling you the story now. And it's come back to me many times in mm -hmm. private reflections. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. I never forgot her words. I never forgot her hungry, I call them hungry, searching eyes. Mm -hmm. Hungry because she obviously wanted to be filled by something, and I hadn't been doing it. Mm -hmm. okay? I never forgot her hungry, searching eyes. Where did those words come from? It's almost as if you were convicted. Who was this strange woman? Yeah, she had Just put me in the right. dock and pronounced me guilty. Oh, my. Yeah. Well, this is a okay. kind of a surprising yeah. uh, something that happened and also, yeah. but it, it helped change you, didn't it? It, it did. It did, Jacqueline. Uh, I, I didn't know where the words came from. I didn't know who this strange woman was. Mm-hmm. But I did have the sense that the Lord had spoken to me in those unsettling words. Okay, so you explain. I had the sense that those hungry eyes that I could not fill had pinned me to the wall. Wow. Okay, all right. Right. His grace was in them. Right. And <clears throat> that was the beginning. That question literally shocked me you understand that? Shocked yeah. me in, mm -hmm. into, into beginning to change my ways. That happened. Mm -hmm. And. So I would say this is your. Where I started, I never even knew her name. Wow. So this could have been your electric eel moment, Bishop? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what I did after that. I said I, I knew I needed to change. Uh, you know, the, the time, that's a long time ago, and the, the, it's a little fuzzy how one thing fits together with the other. Mm -hmm. But I know I began to change. I know I began to pay more attention to the audience rather than to my theories about communication. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I began to very, be very sensitive. If this prayerful woman wasn't being fed by what I was saying, I needed to talk more about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I hadn't stopped talking about the religion, about God and all that, but I didn't, I wasn't meeting her needs, so I, I began to gravitate more in that direction. So what you're saying is you were theorizing what you had learned, and now yeah. you had to look yeah. at your heart and yeah. determine how you're going to become a yeah. priest with a heart. Yeah, that's true. That's true, yeah. That's so how true. long then did this, her question, stay with you? <laughs> I mean, in Gosh, that moment. Jacqueline, that was back in the 70s. 
And today we're in the the twenties of the the new century. Mm-hmm. So that's fifty years ago. It was even that long. So we can uh, gather that that was a very graced moment for sure. It was. Yeah, it was. Uh-huh. So through the years, do you think now, looking back, that you needed that question asked of you then? Yes, I think so now. It was very discomforting at the time. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, that was the exact time I needed it. And she was probably the exact instrument that I would listen to. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I presume that because that's what happened. So Uh, then, if that happened, how did you form interiorly as a result of this occasion? Well, I would do it as I naturally do things. I would revisit what I was doing. I'd revisit some core things that were important to me Mm -hmm. and see if I had them arranged in the right way. I would just kind of take myself apart and Mm re-examine what I had. How did I miss this? Mm -hmm. If this was what I missed, how did... I just I would redo all those things, so I would I would go back. I prepare my homilies in the same way. Mm-hmm. I would seek stories to tell, mm-hmm. but I, I would be very sensitive to this one lady could not find what mm-hmm. she'd really come to church to find, okay. and I, I would try to okay. So you add, become add those things to them more. I uh, what had happened to Jacqueline basically. Uh, I I learned that I knew already I could get in the way of God. Okay. I've known that for a long time. Mm-hmm. But I I I learned some signs that were very personal to me how I could mm-hmm. I need to stop doing what I was doing because I was really I really was elbowing God out of the way. So I guess the first sense that I get is that you learned humility. Yeah, I'd say so. And you, nothing, nothing uh, uh, fosters greater humility than being humiliated. <laughs> 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 it has a strong effect on helping you be humble when you're humiliated. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> so I'm really impressed by that story because um, it helped you then to become a mentor for others and to help you to form others spiritually now as you do your priests and lay uh, yeah. apostles who come to visit yeah. you. Yeah. I tell priests all the time now that <clears throat> when you give a homily, you know, they're not interested in what you think about something. They're interested in what God thinks. Right. So if you haven't been in touch with God and he hasn't told you something in the dark of your prayer, mm-hmm. What he tells you in the dark of your prayer, you need to proclaim in the light on the housetops. That's, That's true. what your homily should be. Right. And I had the bad habit of preparing my own little homily mm-hmm. in the dark mm-hmm. and leaving God out of it in some sense. I, the themes were there, you know, the religious mm-hmm. themes, the mass themes. They were. That was the context, in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But the story I had found and reworked to fit in the, the setting that was more important to me than mm-hmm. those things. So I tell priests all the time, distrust what you're doing when you prepare a homily unless the Lord has given you the mm-hmm. inspiration to follow a certain line of thought. So, uh, Bishop, did you consider the possibility that this woman could have been an angel? Is it possible that she was an angel in bodily form? Mm-hmm. Okay. And my answer to that, Jacqueline, is very simple. I don't know. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible, mm-hmm. given what we believe about angels. Mm-hmm. It's possible. Uh, I've always tended to think that angels tend to work on the edge of a life where we're kind of close to death. Oh, okay. You know? mm-hmm. And I've always tended to think that if angels appeared in bodily form 
they might come at very urgent moments Mm -hmm. when they could do something to to save us. Right. Okay? Something that verges on the miraculous. Right. Okay? And your And so I'm asking myself, okay, now, if that's the case, if they normally work on that margin between life and death... Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, then would this not apply in this situation of yours? Would that apply here with her? Well, I wasn't I wasn't on the margin of life and death physically. Was I on the margin morally, spiritually? Maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I I believe she came into my life at the right time, precisely the right time, Mm -hmm. to do something. She did have an effect on the way I changed and the way I began to Mm -hmm. approach people. She had an effect on my being too bookish, too cerebral, and I Mm -hmm. I would try to be more of a person of the heart. Mm -hmm. She had those effects. Was a, was it an urgent case for me to know that just then, just that way, with just that shattering question? <laughs> maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I don't know. Well, knowing you, I think maybe that could have been the case because you had a tendency then, and plus you were going through some dark times, mm-hmm. to go inward and also escape in words and stories mm-hmm. uh, that you were talking about. So having someone come up to you who disarmed you right. that's what usually happens yeah. was f- profound and fundamental to your growth and spirit yes yes it was so this is the first time you're actually speaking about this and I'm so very grateful yeah I the story was important to me mm-hmm. but I never really thought of it in terms of angels of an angel coming mm-hmm. so now so is it poss- was it possible she was sure it is So, Bishop Gilmore, you mentioned that you had a tendency to become more bookish. And I wondered, when you start to become bookish, do you reflect back on this incident and the woman who came to you? I hadn't thought of that woman for for years, really. I, until you asked me to prepare a story (laughs) for this this, uh, Mm -hmm. podcast, uh... I remember mentioning her one time, maybe in a retreat, mentioning a lady asking me a question. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, I haven't really, I don't think much about her anymore. When I think about her, I, I, there is gratitude in my heart for her. Mm -hmm. There's a little sadness in my heart because I let her down. That's about all I can say Mm -hmm. when I'm thinking about her. Bishop, I've had similar experiences, and I think when I reflect back on those experiences, I would say that it's not really the person that you have to remember that comes to you, but it's the message that was given to you, because that stays in your heart more profoundly than the messenger who offers you the message. What do you think, Bishop? Yeah, and I I would say that rings true with me. It was the message, the question itself. Uh, But again... I, if she was human, I have a certain tinge of sadness because I let her down, and a certain and a great wash, a rush of uh, gratitude because she woke me up. Hmm. Well, thank you, Bishop, for sharing the story with us. It was very unique. It was very thought provoking, and it also elicits our curiosity. I um. I think the Lord loves us so much, and if she was an angel, we can tell that he looks after us, and if he's not an angel, this woman was very special. So thank you very much, Bishop Gilmore, for speaking to us today. Thank you for inviting me. If this podcast recording has made an impact in your life, please consider donating to our ministry at www.gracethatreigns.com. Goodbye, everyone.